This is one of a series of eight films featuring some of the early pioneers of quality improvement in the NHS, who share their personal stories and the practical wisdom gained from leading improvement when it was still a niche activity. The idea for the films was originally conceived during a conversation between Peter Wilcock and Helen Bevan about capturing the legacy of early improvement leaders and it was given life by the publication of the National Framework for Action on Improvement and Leadership Development. I've been privileged to have met all of the leaders featured in this series of films early on in my own improvement career and so I found it fascinating hearing their reflections as they look back on their experiences. We hope that their stories will make a powerful contribution not only to those of you implementing the new national framework but to everyone aspiring to improve healthcare. Where did you first learn about quality improvement methods? It's something sure I've had the joys and the frustrations of trying to make quality improvement work for, for all my career, really. And I, I first learned about it not in the NHS at all. When I left university, I started working in the manufacturing industry. I had 10 years there working in the glass industry. And that's where I learned my quality improvement method before it was even called Lean, when it was called Kaizen, teaching quality improvement methods to factory floor, shop floor workers, and helping them improve the work they did and improve the product they produced. Okay, great. And what led you from manufacturing into healthcare? I guess I kind of had an early midlife crisis at the age of 29 and decided that manufacturing wasn't for me. I'm married to a radiographer. She said, why don't you try this NHS thing? I'm, I'm probably like a lot of people, I suppose I wanted to, to do some good in society, to help people, a bit naive about what that involved, so I was going for a nice quiet life in the NHS and it didn't, didn't quite turn out that way. Okay, and, and did you find it easy bringing in what you'd learnt on quality improvement from manufacturing into a new environment? So I was really surprised when I joined the NHS in 1989 that for a business that was all about improving the quality of care for patients, whilst individual clinicians cared a lot about the patient they were looking after, what I didn't see was the kind of systematic approach to improving quality that I'd seen in manufacturing. Pilkinson were investing more in preventing defects in windscreens than the NHS were investing in preventing quality of care to patients. And, and so actually bringing in those ideas was quite a struggle and I think it took me the first decade of my career to work out in the NHS how we might do that. So I know that in the early 2000s obviously having worked with you you had a national role leading the modernisation agency um, what was your key learning from that particular experience? The modernisation agency was a, a fantastic privilege to be involved with that and also a huge learning opportunity although I'd done some things to apply quality improvement in earlier NHS roles in health authorities and at North Stafford Hospital I hadn't really fully understood the potential of it until I worked with some fantastic colleagues in the modernisation agency there was the opportunity to learn from the people who were working with me people like Helen Bevan and Aidan Halligan and John Oldham who were real pioneers in, in quality improvement in this country. Learning from international examples, from IHI, getting to visit places like Kaiser Permanente in the US. But also meeting people like Professor Dan Jones who wrote Lean Thinking, um, who supported us with some of the agency's work. And that opened up whole new vistas about the kind of improvement approaches that were taking place outside of healthcare that the NHS could learn from. Okay. And after leaving the MA in 2004, you were Chief Executive for six years at Bolton Hospital. Um, and I know there you developed the, um, the Bolton Improving Care System. Can you tell us what that involved? So, uh, when I went back into the NHS from the Modernisation Agency to Bolton in 2004, I was determined to do the Chief Executive job in a different way to the way I'd done it previously, having learned what I'd learned. And I was really interested to think, how could we take a hospital and really build a system and culture for improvement that engaged every single member of staff and engaged with patients in a very different way? And that's what we set out to do over a six-year period. So putting the patient at the heart of that, deeply engaging patients as partners in our improvement work. We trained over 3,500 staff in improvement, um, mainly in lean tools and techniques. 
We set out to redesign the end-to-end patient journey through the hospital. We did many of those and that involved hundreds, literally hundreds of improvement projects. Um, and we aligned our business plan with that. So it, it became not an improvement project or programme, but the way we went about our work. And there were many things we didn't get right, many lessons to be learned. But we also generated some fantastic results over that six year period. Okay, so going back to your work in Bolton, what were some of the kind of key challenges that you experienced and how did you overcome those? So there are always lots of challenges when you're doing improvement work, both technical ones and people ones. In my experience, the technical ones are the easier bits. And when I was at Bolton, we started on a journey of using Toyota production system, lean tools and techniques, and that generated quite a lot of scepticism. I vividly remember one of my consultant surgeons who took me to one side and put an arm around my shoulder and said, what you've got to understand, David, is we're not Japanese and we don't make cars. Very astute of him. I, but there was that sense that this is really alien. What could we possibly learn from this? So overcoming that initial reluctance was, was challenge one. Even when you do that, though, freeing up the time for busy staff to take them away from the day job to work on improvement requires a lot of courage and quite a lot of logistical planning and thinking. If you're going to take an orthopaedic surgeon out of our operating theatre and get her on an improvement team for a week, then that's, that's quite a risk for the organisation. And thirdly, particularly when you start on any improvement journey, people don't always believe this is going to deliver results. So you have to hold the faith, you have to be able to give people confidence that this will take time. But if we keep working at it, there's lots of evidence from the best in healthcare and from other sectors that this is the best way to get sustainable results, not performance management or competition and choice. All those things have their place, but deeply involving people and giving them the skills and the time to make improvements for themselves, that's the way we get sustainable improvement. And of those results, what are you most proud of having achieved? I, I, there were some, the, the staff in Bolton delivered some amazing results during the time I was there and have continued to do so since, um, particularly concentrating on quality of patient care. So one of the earliest pieces of work we did was for patients with fractured hips. We reduced mortality by 50%. Um, we had a problem <laughs> when we started. Uh, we also significantly reduced length of stay and took beds out, so we improved quality and we improved productivity at the same time. And then we managed to repeat that in stroke services, improvements in mortality by 33%, a third, 25% off length of stay there. And then many, many more successes, reducing waiting times for test results in pathology and radiology. Um, taking out floor space so we avoided having to spend money on expensive new developments. Um, by the time I left, over half of the annual savings from the ho from, for the hospital were generated from this improvement work. I suppose most satisfyingly of all in a way was to see staff grow and develop and thrive and, and be inspired by the work they were doing. Okay, and so obviously staff engagement was one of the kind of core ingredients for success that, that you've articulated. What would the others be? So I think one of the most damaging things people can do when they're trying to set up an improvement programme is bring management consultants in to do it to the organisation. It's only sustainable if the frontline staff are deeply engaged and, and own it for themselves. And that's a real challenge, freeing up the time, giving people the support to make that happen. And then alongside that, really strong patient engagement. The quality improvement work is so much more powerful if, if patients are full partners. Using a robust method, because the NHS likes nothing more than setting up a committee, and the committee degenerates into a whinging session, frankly. And the way out of that is to use a robust method. So you gather some data, you analyse it, you develop a hypothesis, you test some options, you learn from those, and you go on through successive iterations to bring about improvement. Um, those are all key factors. And then I think most important of all, and this might be reflecting on maybe what we didn't quite get right with the modernisation agency. The modernisation agency trained 100,000 clinical staff in improvement. We never really engaged chief executives and boards at scale in the way we should have done. So having the senior leadership team and the board engaged with this work in Bolton, putting their weight behind it, was I think really, really important. Okay. And as a busy chief executive and with busy, a busy executive team and board, 
How did you find the time and also the personal resilience to keep that focus on quality improvement in the organisation? Mm. Yeah, two different things, I think. So how did I free up the time and how did I stay resilient? The time is a challenge. And actually, one of the things I wished I'd learned earlier in my career was there's a lot of meetings that you sit in that don't add a lot of value. There's a lot of emails you've got to do that don't add a lot of value. Getting out from underneath those, you can really contribute so much more. So creating the time, you've got to be disciplined, you've got to delegate, and you've got to learn to say no and focus on the things that can really, really make a difference. Actually, I, I don't think you needed resilience to do the improvement work um, because the improvement work was genuinely really inspiring. Hearing staff each month present out the results of the work they've been doing was, was just a real buzz. Um, what was difficult, I think, was managing the business as usual alongside it. The foundation trust application, the finances, the A&E target. Whilst we were trying to use improvement method to tackle some of those problems, that was never going to happen overnight. So keeping the resilience to keep things as they were going, to deal with the daily problems and challenges, whilst getting the improvement work off the ground, that keeping those plates spinning, I think, was a challenge. Okay. And how did you manage to embed those the improvements that you did make within the organisation? So I think the, the key to embedding lies in... Um, working at it for sufficiently long because if you do the attitudes the behaviors and the culture starts to change um, make i think training and development is so important so giving staff the skills but then also the time to apply what they've done and i think if you're going to have an improvement culture leaders and managers in the organization have to work in a different way if on the business as usual the a and e target and the money you have the old style of just telling people what to do but then when you're doing your improvement work, you're encouraging them to think for themselves and empower and enable them, people get very sceptical. So you've really got to develop a different kind of leadership style and culture within the organisation if improvement is going to be embedded and sustained. So you're obviously a real learner um, and, and try and learn iteratively as you go through um, your, your different roles in the NHS. If you were going to do the work again now in Bolton, what would you do differently? Uh, there are many, many, many things I would do differently if I had my time over again in Bolton, indeed in any of the jobs that I've, I've done. Um, and it is important, I think, one of the key lessons for quality improvers is, is to have a bit of humility, to recognise you're not getting everything right and to reflect and to learn from the things that go wrong. So in Bolton, I think we didn't um, communicate well enough early enough and engaged staff. We started with a handful of enthusiasts and they were really inspired, but everybody else was quite sceptical about that. So as time went on, we developed a much broader program of, of staff engagement and communications alongside the quality improvement work. I don't think we had a clear enough measurement strategy early enough, so we felt we were making improvements, but could we robustly demonstrate that? So being really clear how we're measuring outcomes and progress towards those outcomes, I think, is really critical. We had a few leaders early on who were actively engaged, but not the whole of the leadership body, certainly not the whole of the board. Um, halfway through, we actually took the board through a full two-day training and development programme on lean and have them walking around the hospital with clipboards and doing waste spotting in A&E, and, and they loved it. And that sent such a big signal to the rest of the organisation that the board were now role modelling the way we wanted the whole organisation to work. So lots and lots of lessons and um, you never get it all right from day one. So after leaving Bolton, you left and set up the Advancing Quality Alliance or ACWA and you've been um, doing that for the last sort of seven, seven years now, helping develop leaders and spread improvement um, methods across the northwest of England. What have you been learning during your work at Aqua? So um, I've been very lucky to have some terrific jobs and now with Aqua, the Advancing Quality Alliance, that has been around for six years. I'm trying to take some of what we learned in Bolton and get it to spread right across the northwest of England. One of the big things I've learned is it's easier to help other people to do it than it is to do it yourself. And I think people who are in support roles, either at regional or at national level, would do well to remember that. Yes. The people who are really at the sharp end are the people who are in the A&E department, in the general practice, in the community mental health team, under huge pressure, and at the same time trying to improve the work that they do. 
And one of the things we've discovered in Aqua is you need to think carefully about how you do get that practice to spread, how you get accelerated adoption of what we know works. And, and the things that we concentrate on are having a very clear evidence base and some robust data, finding the champions, and there might be clinical champions, there might be managerial champions, creating opportunities for them to come together so you get peer-to-peer -peer spread, and crucially, investing in using a robust improvement method that works just as much whether you're working on a regional basis or you're working inside an institution. And probably one of the final big lessons, because this is a change in the last six years, is I think the problems of tomorrow are not just organisational problems, they are system problems. And we need to encourage people to get out beyond the boundaries of their institutions and work together um, across hospital, community, primary care, and critically with social care and other local government colleagues to make things better for patients and physicians. What does that mean for leaders then? Um, I think leaders need to unlearn some of the things that they've learned as they've gone through their career. People get to the top in the NHS or in social care by being good at running organisations. And we do need people who are good at running organisations. It's not necessarily the same set of skills as you need to lead across a complex system. You need to be able to manage through influence and persuasion, not just work through the weight of having a hierarchy behind you. You need to genuinely want to understand your partner's interests and wishes and needs and build a coalition of interests that's delivering a shared vision, a shared aim, a shared goal. And we have many great leaders in the NHS who are capable of working in that way. We need to really nurture those, those system leadership behaviours, I think. So it's now recognised that developing a culture of continuous learning and improvement is essential and core business for the NHS. As an early pioneer in this work, what advice would you give to today's leaders of quality improvement? Um, I'm not sure whether it's advice, I guess it's stuff I've learned along the way. Um, I think the first is be curious. Um, the, the solutions to tomorrow's problems won't be what we've done in the past. So look very broadly to find new knowledge, new ways to do things. Look at other organisations in the NHS, but other organisations internationally in healthcare. Look over the wall into other sectors, what local governments are doing. Go and visit your local factory and see how they make improvements. There's so much learning to be had if we've just got that bit of curiosity. Secondly, I think really put the patient and the citizen at the centre. If we deeply engage them, if we have them on our improvement teams, yeah. we'll get much better results. And the future should be a different kind of relationship with patients, one where they are full partners in their care and where we support them to make the right decisions about their care. And I think thirdly, stay resilient. You know, it's a tough time at the moment in the NHS and in local government. This needs to be for the long haul and you need to keep all those plates spinning, deliver what's needed in your day job while starting to build some really deep improvement expertise. So stick out that. It's not an easy road, but it's what's gonna get it's what's gonna get us the results we need. Okay, and final question. If you could travel back in time and have a chat with your younger self <laughs> and pass on some wisdom. Um, just as you're starting out in your healthcare improvement journey, what would you say to that younger self? Oh, if I could say something to my younger self, I think I would definitely say, don't spend as much time in boring meetings. You think you need to be seen there? You know, you need, you need to think you do all the emails, although when I started, actually they were on paper. It wasn't even email. Um, if you really prioritise getting out for yourself, seeing the work at the front line, engaging with frontline staff and patients, working with them to get the service to improve, that's the real job. You need to spend a bit of time in meetings, but it's much more fun and delivers much better results when you get out there and do the real work with the people.